to speak. Okay. Okay. Just make it short. Oh yes. <laughs> okay. Well. Okay. Okay. So we have a pleasure today to have uh, Eric Van Strijlen to present our colloquium. Uh, Eric is a emeritus professor at Creole University of Central Florida. He got his PhD long time ago at the uh, uh, Optical Science Center of uh, University of Arizona. After uh, Arizona, he spent some time at the uh, University of uh, Southern California. Then he moved to University of North Texas, where he spent uh, about 10 years there. So after that, he moved with some other colleagues from uh, from North Texas to Florida, where they start, uh, they found, uh, they start one uh, center for optics and uh, lasers. The original name was Creo, a center for research in electro optics and lasers. Now the name is different. It is something like a center for photonics. Center for Research in Education in Optics and Lasers. Okay. <laughs> but the College of Optics and Photonics. I, I remember right. the, the... Down here at the bottom, right here. Yeah. <laughs> so they, they are in the University of Central Florida. Uh, Eric assumed some uh, positions there. He was director of the center in 1999. When he they created the College of Optics and Photonics, he became the first dean of this uh, place. And so he is there for a very long time. Eric is a fellow of uh, Optical Society, uh, IEEE, SPY, and American Physical Society. He was president of OSA. And uh, well, he got a very important prize from OSA, uh, the R.W. Wood Prize. Up to now, he supervised about 40 PhDs there, many papers published, more than 300 papers, uh, big number of citations, more than 36,000 citations in Google Scholar with a H index 79. He has one very important paper. Uh, for some time, he was uh named as the inventor of the technique of z scan technique which is uh well he published a few papers the second paper in this area which is the most cited one i found yesterday the this paper at ieee quantum electronics it was 1990 has more than 9,000 citations <laughs> it's a enormous number of citations so He's a Z-scan man. So uh, more recently, he with uh, associates there, they developed a new technique, a new method for nonlinear spectroscopy, uh, where they look for beam deflection uh, in a sample. I think that that's the subject for his talk today. We have uh, uh, Eric have a uh, long time connections with Brazil. Uh, I think that he came to Brazil four times, four or five times. I don't know exactly. I think maybe five. Yeah. 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 First time I was, I invited him to uh, his Vieca school at Campinas. I don't remember the date, but uh, it was, I think it was the first time, right? He came to receive twice. We start our student chapter when he was president of the, of OSA. And when the student chapter commemorated 10 years, he came again to receive. I think it was the second time he came with uh, Donna Strickland and they spent here one week, one week here. His connection with Brazil is more than uh, just a receive. He had uh, two postdocs, two Brazilian postdocs some time ago. I think that the first one was Kleber Mendoza from uh, San Carlos and uh, also Lazaro, Lazaro Patilha from uh, Unicamp. So we have uh, this long uh, time interaction with uh, Eric Van Strijlen and it's real a real pleasure to have his talk today. 
for us in here. So Eric, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. So please. Uh, uh, thank you, thank you, Sid. Yeah, we've we've had a long uh, a long history with Sid and and uh, Anderson and and others in Brazil. So uh, I still don't speak Portuguese though, but <laughs> but maybe someday. Uh, excuse, maybe someday. Me, excuse me. Uh, I have a, a joke. He does not speak Portuguese, neither French. Uh, <laughs> he he came to Angers, and he said that uh, I talk that the name of the city is Angers. <laughs> yeah, I wonder why everybody's so upset there. No. <laughs> All right. Hey, thanks for having me. I wish I wish I were there, uh, but we got to use this uh, this platform uh, during these uh, interesting times. So this is actually the, the the view graph you've been looking at is a picture of the Creole building, uh, and actually I should get an update because there's now an addition that we just finished in the back of the building back here. So uh, it, it's getting bigger now. So, so um, I'm not going to show a lot of equations uh, in this in this in this talk, but I need to start off with it with a couple of things. Uh, so I'm going to be talking primarily about nonlinear refraction, but there's a little bit about nonlinear absorption. And so uh, linear, you got the change in the radiance with respect to depth in the sample as the light goes through, is just minus alpha i. So if you double the irradiance, uh, you know the the you you have twice, you know, the, the light just keeps going through linearly. But at high intensities, the absorption becomes a function of the irradiance. It's no longer a constant of the material. And if you expand this, you find out the first term there is something called two-photon absorption coefficient. And so the absorption is, is linear in I, or di dz is quadratic in I. And so what happens is, is that in a material, if you have a ground state and an excited state, the photon energy is not enough to get you to that excited state. But if you add the photon energies of two photons, you get to that, that final state. And then DIDZ is minus alpha I squared. And we do a lot of work with semiconductors and the same sort of thing. You go from the valence band to the conduction band with the two photons. Well, it turns out that if the absorption is a function of irradiance, the index is also a function of the irradiance. And it, it turns out those two are actually related by ca causality, which I won't talk about much today, but uh, it's important to note that. But it's not always that simple because oftentimes when you have two photon absorption, you move some of the, some of the ground state materials to the excited state or into the conduction band. And at that point, you create electron hole pairs and they can also, and the generation rate for those goes like, if you don't have any linear absorption, it becomes quadratic in, in I squared. And then, oops, I got to remember which button to push. Then you can also have linear absorption if there's a state up here that's proportional to that cross section and the number density you create in here. So this thing goes like an integral of I squared. So this, this start look, starts looking like a higher order nonlinearity. And the same thing goes for semiconductors. If you know these equations, it turns out you can talk about semiconductors. You can talk about organic dyes, solvents to do similar things, even gases, plasmonic complexes, et cetera, really are all governed by very similar sets of equations. So these are important things to, to know and uh, I'll be using results from this as we go through here. But I want to spend time on nonlinear refraction. I mean, if you're looking at nonlinear absorption, you just have a beam, and it's a beam that's uh, like we usually try to get Gaussian beams because we know how they propagate. Here is a, a, a beam that's bright in the middle, dim on the wings. You simply go through a nonlinear material and detect how much light gets through, and that'll tell you about how much losses there are. You do that at a function of radiance, and you can, you can tell what the nonlinear absorption is. But for nonlinear refraction, I have a beam that comes through here. If the index of refraction is dependent upon that irradiance, when that goes through the sample, there's a Gaussian profile on the irradiance. If I let N2 be less than zero, then the optical path length looks like something that looks like a negative lens. The optical path length is small here. So if you look at a phase front, if you had a flat phase front going in, the flat face front goes faster, gets through faster than the wings, and therefore it is a diverging beam. It's a self-defocusing nonlinearity. And you can, the beam, if you get to the far field of the detector, you can actually miss some of the energy. 
And that's why it makes some of these experiments difficult because you have to take into account all of these different processes that occur. This was talking about an N2, but if you had free carriers and these free carriers always give you self defocusing, when you create these free carriers, you even make a bigger uh, beam distortion in the material. And so I'm gonna spend a lot of time talking about this beam distortion, if you want, that comes in. For sources, we usually, we're, we, use, we have nanosecond lasers, we have picosecond lasers, we have femtosecond lasers. In the last few years, we've really spent most of our time with femtosecond lasers. And with femtosecond lasers, you can actually have tunable sources with optical parametric devices. But I really like this, this white light femtosecond continuum. So if we take a millijoule of light at around 800 nanometers coming directly out of a femtosecond laser, and we weakly focus this in, the, in this meter long cell filled with, uh, with like krypton gas at, at a couple atmospheres. And then I reflect that, what comes through off of a grating and reflect it on the wall, I get this very beautiful white light continuum. And we can actually make that very bright by seeding it. I just love this movie. So let me show this movie where Trenton uh, moves a delay. So if you get that seed, so it's not temporarily overlapped with that one millijoule, it's one microjoule seed with one millijoule, but you make it so they are temporarily overlapped. It's not temporarily overlapped and right there. Now it's temporarily overlapped. Look how bright that gets. And it goes all the way from the infrared to the ultraviolet. And we can use that as not only pumps, but we can use it as seed, as as uh, as probes, and it's a very nice methodology for using uh, to to do some of these experiments. So, for example, we build an nonlinear optical spectrometer where we come in with some bright excitation beam, and then we have this white light continuum as a probe beam, and we look on a on a, a dual channel spectro spectrometer. And what happens then, as you go through, is you absorb one photon from the excitation beam. And then the second photon comes from this white light continuum and you can see that full absorption spectrum. And I can actually take a movie here. It turns out that that white light, when you make that white light, that it, it is chirped, meaning the different colors come out at slightly different times. And then if I change the temporal delay between the pump and the probe, then I will overlap the white light continuum in different spectral regions at different time delays. So if I run this movie, this is a picture of the beam coming through the sample. This is a picture of the function, I, I meant to write spectrum here. This is wavelength in this axis. And if I run this movie, as I change the temporal delay, different regions of the spectrum overlap with that pump at different times, and it takes out different regions of that spectrum. And um, let me run that one more time here. Yeah. And so now you can look at, at what comes through. You can actually see the color change. And here I've, I've, I've had that, that uh, excitation beam extremely bright. Uh, I wouldn't do an experiment that, with it that bright. I'd, I'd make it weaker. So I'd have a small change. And then we can actually get the spectrum of the two photon absorption as a function of that uh, temporal delay. And I can build up a spectrum very rapidly with this. So that experiment is a pump probe experiment where I monitor how much transmission I get as a function of temporal delay. This is a single wavelength measurement for different irradiance levels. And again, I see this, this two photon absorption peak, but also at very high irradiances, I see that even after the sample, after the excitation beam is off, I've left carriers up here that are absorbing the sample. So I can separate out the instantaneous two photon absorption from the free carrier refraction that occurs later by doing these time resolved measurements. And I can look at the time dynamics of that nonlinear absorption. So this is a very powerful technique for looking at nonlinear absorption. But what we really would like to do for this is we want an equally simple method for measuring nonlinear refraction. And so recently, recently, the last several years, we developed this technique that Sid mentioned of beam deflection. So in this method, again, it's a quite simple pump probe, but what we do is we have our Gaussian shaped excitation beam, if you follow my uh, pointer here, and this Gaussian shaped excitation beam, again, changes the index of refraction of the material with a Gaussian shape. Well, now I take a probe, but I make the probe much smaller than the excitation beam, 
and I move it over to the side where it's looking at a region where the index of refraction, the changed index of refraction, has a big gradient on it. Well, if I look at this I, I, as, a, as an induced gradient, it really looks like a prism. So when the beam goes through this induced ch changed index, it sees a prism. And if it's a positive nonlinearity, it gets deflected in this direction. And it gets deflected as a, by an angle that looks at the gradient of the changed index integrated over the spatial profile of this weak probe beam. And so if I get one of these nice quad cells that are in every atomic force microscopy, that's the way atomic force microscopy is, is detected. They just watch the beam deflection uh, on, a, on this profilimeter profil, you know, uh, with a mirror. I will see that the energy in the upper, the energy in the lower half minus the upper, uh, energy in the upper half, so three plus four minus one plus two uh, is zero without that excitation beam on, but then I turn the excitation beam on and it gets deflected. And I see that that difference in energy between the bottom and the top divided by the total energy, one plus two plus three plus four is greater than zero. And I see that I've deflected the beam in one direction. If it was negative deflection, I would see it go in the other direction. So I can also see the sign of that change of the, of the index. And then by changing the temporal delay between excitation and probe beams, I can map out the temporal dependence of that change in index. So, uh, and delta E over E is directly proportional to that change in index from this experiment. So it's really quite straightforward. If I put in a sample that only has, uh, where, I, where I'm in a wavelength where I don't have nonlinear absorption, I only have nonlinear index changes, and I use parallel polarizations, I see this basically a cross correlation in time between the excitation and probe beams. If I change the polarization, it turns out for a bound electronic nonlinearity, I'd expect a ratio of three to one, and that's exactly what I see. So I can really tell what's going on in this sample. It's just straight non bound electronic nonlinear refraction. But if I take a sample that has more complicated nonlinearity, like carbon disulfide, which I'll talk a lot about today, I can do parallel perpendicular magic angle, and I can tell the dynamics and the time dynamics of all these nonlinearities. And it also has high, high, very high sensitivity. So if I turn down my, uh, my pump beam so that I can see the signal to noise ratio of delta E over E as a function of pump delay, and here I can see it's very noisy, but I still have a better, better than two to one signal noise. The sensitivity that I can see is 0.3 milliradian beam deflection, which corresponds to at 800 nanometers to a one twenty thousandth of a wave, which is a remarkable sensitivity. And so how big is lambda over 20,000? Well, at 800 nanometers at four tenths of an angstrom, here's the hydrogen bore atom, which is 1.4 angstroms. It says that I can see a, a half of a bore radius uh, change in the, the, the wave front. So when you buy optics, you norm normally it's lambda over eight. For good optical quality, lambda over 10, lambda over 20 is really good optical quality optics. You can't buy much better than that. So this is an incredible sensitivity uh, for this technique. And it's due to the fact that I'm looking at a change in the, in, the, in the beam deflection, only due to the fact that the beam, the excitation beam is on or off. And I use lock-in amplifiers, et cetera, to get this kind of sensitivity. So we can use that sensitivity to very carefully measure these nonlinearities. So carbon disulfide is a molecule, it's a linear molecule, carbon with two sulfur atoms, and it has no permanent dipole moment. But when I apply a strong electric field, it tends to line that molecule up. And this is the, sample, this is the signal I get with parallel polarizations. I come up, I have a bound electronic response, but I also line those molecules up. And then you see those molecules diffusing after the excitation beam is on and slowly decaying due to, due to the thermal motion of, of this liquid CS2 mo molecule. So how does this work? Well, the torque on the molecule is the dipole moment crossed into the electric field. Well, the dipole moment here is induced by the electric field. So the electric field comes on and it takes the electron cloud and displaces it in the direction or opposite to the direction of the electric field, all right? So 
that electric field induces this polarization. Well, P cross E, use the right hand rule, P cross E gives me a torque to move that molecule in the direction of the electric field. So this polarization tries to move in this direction. Well, the electric field at a half a cycle later now is no longer pointing in that direction, it points in this direction. Well, the dipole moment then, the electron cloud can follow that, and so it goes down. And so P cross E is still in the same direction. So the torque is always in the same direction to line those molecules up. And so always, even though the electric field is bouncing back and forth, the torque is always to make that electric, that dipole, uh, that molecule line up in the direction of that electric field. So that's what makes this polarizability always get bigger. And I always have a positive change in index as it goes down. Well, now let me take the probe instead of being parallel. Let me take the probe and make it perpendicular. So now when they lines up, I'm trying to move the electron cloud. I'm trying to move perpendicular to the molecule. Well, they don't. It does. It moves this way, but the electrons move this way where they got the double bond, but doesn't move perpendicular. So it actually reduces the index, and so I see this negative going contribution. Well, this is the bound electronic response going up, and now the nuclear contribution is fighting that, and it goes down. Well, if it goes up if it's parallel, and it goes down if it's perpendicular, there must be an angle between zero and ninety degrees, where I don't, where I see as many molecules going in the direction of the of the electric field as I see going perpendicular to the direction. And that angle is called the magic angle. And then I don't see any effects from that nuclear reorientation. I just see this ultra fast response shown in blue here. The magic angle is interesting. In two dimensions, the magic angle is 45 degrees, halfway between zero and 90. In three dimensions, it's this angle, the angle between here, this corner of the cube, and that opposite corner of the cube. And it turns out that angle is 54.7 degrees. It's sort of the, an analog of 45 degrees in two dimensions. And so you can think, of, think about four dimensions. Uh, so yeah, never mind. Um, anyway, 54.7 and three degrees. So if, if in th three dimensions. So now if I line my system up in, in, that, in that way uh, with the probe coming in at 54.7 degrees here, I don't see the nuclear contributions from reorientation. From those three sets of experiments and the time dependence, I can actually separate out the bound electronic response, which is instantaneous, from the so-called reorientation, which is really called diffusive reorientation, from something called libration. Libration is a little bit more difficult to, these are the people, by the way, that, that worked on this. From libration, in a, in, a, in a liquid material, the molecules try to reorient, but they're sitting banging into the molecules next to them. And so as they're trying to reorient, I don't know if you can see my hands in the picture, but as they're trying to reorient toward that field, they're banging in, so they start oscillating in a, in a little potential well as they, as they move. And that oscillation causes another nuclear-based nonlinearity that's called libration. And there's another one I'll talk about a little bit later, collision-induced nonlinearity. But I can separate all these out, determine their rise times and fall times. I know their symmetry, electronic collision or isotropic, and the, the, these things are reorientational symmetry. And so I can tell all the physics of what's going on in these materials. And then I, from those experiments, I can calculate what you would get, for example, in a single beam experiment like a Z-scan, I can calculate the effective nonlinear refractive index. It'll be the bound electronic response, along with a response due to the, the response function of the nuclear responses, those three nuclear responses, which I now know because I've modeled them. Uh, induced by the electric, by the excitation beam, then convolved with this or, or convoluted with this, uh, this probe beam. And that, doing all of that theory allows me to predict the effective nonlinear refraction that I would measure in a Z-scan as a function of pulse width. That's the blue line. That's the prediction. Well, it turns out that before we did these experiments with beam deflection, we had done Z-scan experiments at 1064 nanometers in black and in green at 700 nanometers, and we weren't able to fit them. 
but now with uh, no fitting parameter, no fitting parameter here, that data fits right on that line. And if you go down here to very short pulses, the nuclear responses are not enabled to, this is only the bound electronic response because all the nuclear responses are slower. So we get to very, very short pulses. We only see the bound electronic response. Very, very long responses, pulses, were dominated by the nuclear response, okay? And we can do other measurements. This was just, this is just the straight parallel polarization. So, so, uh, so basically using the, what we got from the uh, uh, parallel polarization to, to get those responses. This is only bound electric, that's dominated by nuclear. We can also then look at what you get if you use linear polarization light in a Z-scan or circular polarization. And this is the effect that you would get. It would be a fact for 1.5 for a bound electron in nonlinearity, which agrees with theory, and then dominated by the nuclear response at long. Again, no fitting parameters. Everything fits beautifully. We can also look in the long time limit. The long time limit is looking up here at this, at the long time limit for all these wavelengths using these models. And we can do that as a, at many different wavelengths. The air bars are pretty big because we had to use picosecond pulses to look at that non line. But basically, it's a flat line. There's no dispersion. I'm going to use that later when we talk, when we discuss gases. So we really, the whole point of this, and, and then you would do degenerate four wave mixing experiments. Again, the only fitting parameter in here was the magnitude, a beautiful fit to the, to the data. So this cleared up a lot of, a lot of, of, of data taken in the literature many years before that, where here is the N2 measured in an experiment as a function of year published in the literature from multiple different references. And they're all over the place. Notice three orders of magnitude on this, on this uh, axis over here. Well, I can go back to these measurements and see what pulse width did they use. Oops, what pulse width did they use Ah, here, and then put them on this graph where we have this prediction and put them, move them right or left, depending on what the pulse width is. And now the air bars don't look nearly so bad because they're sort of clustering around our predicted value here and clustering around our predicted values here. So knowing these contributions to N2 from a bound electronic and nuclear allows us to, to do this prediction and things work very nicely. Well, in addition to this, Pong Zhao uh, uh, actually measured 24 different molecules, 24 different solid, uh, solvents in, in, the, in the liquid phase. And from that, he could predict for all 24 of these what that pulse with the tennis would be. This is CS2 predicted, pyridine, toluene, chloroform, all these seven, but he did 24 of them. I can't, the graph gets too messy if I put them all on the same uh, graph. Um, so interestingly here, uh, you can relate this to how anisotropic the polarizability would be. It turns out that CS2 is very anisotropic, got double bonds here. So the electrons flow very nicely back and forth in this direction but they don't flow back and forth in this direction very well. So you can look at these different molecules and the, these have smaller. So if you look at uh, oh, what's toluene 2.1, so it has a lower, the change between here and here is not as big as in CS2 and for other molecules. And notice in carbon tetrachloride, the change is quite small. And there's, all these are values are consistent with, this, with this, these anisotropies that were measured by other methods. So we can look at some of these molecules. Here's data on chloroform. Chloroform is carbon with three chlorines and a hydrogen. So it's an anisotropic molecule. And so here's parallel, here's perpendicular. And we can see that in the perpendicular, this reorientation uh, wins out, so it comes negative. Well, and here's the magic angle. Well, let me go to another, another molecule that's almost the same, carbon tetrachloride. I just changed that hydrogen for chlorine. Now it's a perfectly symmetric molecule in three dimensions. And so there's no anisotropy. So this never goes negative. And so you can really tell something about the molecule just looking from these curves. 
another one. So, oh, yeah. So here, expect no nuclear contribution. Well, not quite. Notice it does, carbon tetrachloride does do something different. Well, that's because there's another nuclear contribution, this collisional nonlinearity. <clears throat> so what's the collisional nonlinearity? When you uh, induce a dipole in these molecules and then they're in liquid form, the, that dipole affects the dipole of the neighboring molecule. So the molecules interact. It's a molecular interaction between the different polarizability tensors to change the index of refraction. And so this is a collisional induced nonlinear refraction that's still a slow nonlinearity on the time scale of the bound electronic response, but it's not a, it's not a huge effect. So we can actually separate those out in, in these molecules. So um, let's look at another one. Here's benzene. Again, double, double bonds. The, the electrons are very free to move around. And I see this very clear reorientation. But hang on. Benzene is symmetric, right? Well, it's symmetric in these two dimensions, but not in the third. In that third dimension, it can still line up. And that it gives me a big effect in that third dimension that, that still gives me this reorientational nonlinearity. Well, let me look at another molecule where I get rid of those double bonds by instead of having double bonds, I put an extra hydrogen on each one of those. Now I don't, I don't see this. It, if you look carefully, it does, it does actually dip down, but the, but the electrons are not, the electrons are not very free to move across this molecule. So the anisotropy tensor, the anisotropy tensor is very weak. So I very see very little reorientational nonlinearity. So you can really classify these molecules very nicely with these experiments. So the, one of the last things we did with this is we looked at the just the bound electronic nonlinear refraction in this molecule as a function of photon energy. We also looked at two photon absorption. But how did we do this? Well, we only used the extremely short pulses to measure each one of these. So we just used very short femtosecond pulses down at the 30, 30 to 50 femtosecond range. So we're only looking at the bound electronic response here. And that gives us the bound electronic nonlinear dispersion. This, these lines represent a sum over states model where we've not included any nuclear contributions. And that it is related to the two photon absorption, which we see when we get into the ultraviolet here, given by this blue line. And if you think about it, you think about a, a linear, a linear abs, uh, absorption profile, and you think about the linear index, the linear index would come up here and then it would come down and, and go up like, like so. Well, the theory fits pretty well, except right here. It probably says that there's another two photon absorption line farther to the UV that we're not including that's tending to raise this thing up uh, to, to give us this effect. But in any case, we can see this dispersion of the nonlinear refractive index. And these are related to causality by chromis cronin relationships, which again, I'm not going to talk about. But it's a very nice uh, way. And we've really very carefully now determined the nonlinear refraction in, CF, in, in carbon in, uh, in uh, CS2. Last thing I want to mention is, is if you look with very short pulses, you can also excite the bandwidth of the excitation pulses enough to start exciting the vibrational bands. And since you're hitting this basically with a hammer, a delta function response, you have a coherent excitation of the vibrational motion, if you want, of the phonons in, the, in this liquid, if you want. And you can see those that vibration uh, in these materials. But it doesn't really change the index of refraction very much. Uh, it changes it down. This is 10 uh, percent of the, of the collision. Uh, so it's a small effect. And so for the most part, we can ignore it. We'll talk about this a little bit more. So let's do the experiment in the laboratory again. So we're going to do the same experiment we did on CS2, but we remove the, we remove the cuvette, we remove the sample, and here's what we see. We had to turn the irradiance up to do this, but this is in the lab, and it's not in a vacuum tube. So this is due to air. Well, air has a nitrogen, which is a nitrogen molecule. It also has oxygen. They're, they're, they don't have a dipole moment, but they're polarizable molecules with, with uh, two, two nitrogens or two oxygens. And all this stuff is not noise. This is the first 50 picoseconds of it. This is real signal. 
the purple is the is the is a theoretical fit to the black which is the data uh and so i want to talk uh spend the rest of the time talking about this this stuff and again we can do the same thing we can do parallel perpendicular magic angle and magic angle only has the stuff that occurs within the pulse width remember our pulses are only like 100 femtoseconds so these things are all occurring well after we did not see this in in the liquid cs2 what we saw in the liquid cs2 it just came up within less than a picosecond it, it decayed away so now we're seeing something that are called recurrences and uh it's only going to happen in gases so with a magic angle we can get rid of that and we don't see any of those effects we only see the ultra fast uh responses so what do these do to well here's oxygen the theory for oxygen here's the theory for nitrogen Here's the theory for the sum of them when you weight them with the, how the, the concentration in the air. And it very nicely fits exactly what you would expect, the sum of that with what you would expect. So what's going on? Well, let's, let's look at very low temperatures where I've only got one rotational line of, in the ground state uh, of, of the rotational lines. And let me come in with electric field. So the electric field comes in, and that's going to put a torque Put a torque on the molecule which is going to try to line it up but then it's going to just keep rotating right after the pulse is gone it's still rotating so as it's rotating the the index goes down here because i'm looking along the parallel pose here the index goes up and here it comes down etc right so it just keeps oscillating so that's what i'm seeing and if i but but what i'm going to see is not a single molecule because some of those molecules started out perpendicular some started out in other ranks so i'm going to see an ensemble average and the ensemble average is going to average out in the xy and i'm only going to see a change in the in the in the orientation this way so it goes up and down i'm, I'm just basically adding the y the the uh, these uh, nuclear functions if you want and so i see it going up and down well we didn't do any experiments at low temperature we did experiments in the lab and the experiments in the lab are now at high temperatures and at high temperatures i've got all these rotational bands uh, excited and they're all quantized right so I and and turns out for this it's a Raman transition when I go when I make this transition this thing tends to reorient it but I make a transition from J equals uh, uh, you know two to four four to six you know five to seven etc and some of these molecules will then be rotating rapidly some of them will be rotating slowly now when I come through I'm gonna have a whole slew of these molecules wrote that are rotating at different frequencies but notice oh right there they all started to get in in line and here whoa they get in line and i see i see these effects and again and when i come over here and what's going on there it's just due to the fact that this is a two-dimensional representation of a three-dimensional thing but i can even see it in two dimensions all right and it's due to the fact that all of these things are equally spaced that I get these this effect. So let's think about a laser cavity mode. So laser cavity modes are here. And what I do in a mode locked laser is I have all these different cavity modes with the fundamental frequency, second harmonic, third harmonic of the, of the equally spaced modes. They're phased and they're equal spacing. Well, here, here I have the the rotational levels are equally spaced approximately at least and they phase them because i have basically a delta function pulse at time t equals zero to phase them so as i go through and i do this i go along this this the simulation isn't quite right i see if anybody notices what's not quite right about it but as i go along here they all phase up at these different levels and uh, interestingly, I, they don't just phase up at one full cycle. I get these quarter cycles and half cycles and three quarter cycles because of the strange set of J equals plus or minus two uh, and the selection rules that, that, that occur for these, uh, for these molecules. But these are not, not laser pulses. These are pulses of refractive index when these molecules line up to give me a macroscopic change in the index of refraction. So a very strange sort of effect. And so each one of these pulses is a pulse of refractive index change that were all phased at time t equals zero. And the dephasing here is primarily just due to, to, the, mole to the molecules in the air colliding with each other and losing their phase. 
This is a time domain representation. Let's take the Fourier transform of this 300 picosecond scale time dependent data. Here it is. This is the imaginary part of the Fourier transform. This is just the rotational Raman spectrum of oxygen and nitrogen. Oxygen being blue, nitrogen being uh, red. And I can blow this one up and I can see that, hey, boy, it matches up, theory matches up perfectly. And it only matches up perfectly at high J values if I include centrifugal distortion. So it's not a perfect comb. This is without centrifugal distortion. This is with the centrifugal distortion. That adds a little bit of decay, basically, to the, to the uh, frequency combs, if you want, but, but not much. So I can really uh, tell what's going on with this thing. But in the time domain, I not only have information from the imaginary part of the Fourier transform, but I also have, since I'm taking uh, the, the time domain data is real data, when I take a Fourier transform, I get real and imaginary parts because I've got an imaginary uh, exponential here. So here's the real part of that Fourier transform. This gives me the dispersion of, of the index uh, due to the Raman transitions. And as far as I know, this is the only methodology that's ever been done to make that measurement. So the time domain signal has both the nonlinear absorption spectrum and the nonlinear refraction information both included in that one time domain signal. So the time domain is a, is a nice way to do that. I, and I only show this. This is the math. It's a mess. But I only wanted to show this because this, that how, what the temperature is, has a, a big effect on what you're going to see in that time domain uh, spectrum and how 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 broad those recurrences occur, et cetera. So what happens when you if you only had a few of these added up together, you'd you'd only see a certain amount. So as I increase the temperature, I have more and more of the Raman transitions available to add up to see these different spikes. And uh, then when you add those all up at high temperature, I only get a spike at, at t equals zero at one quarter cycle, half cycle, three quarter cycle, and then a full, and then and then they start decaying after that. So, uh, you know, it's really kind of, it's really a fun physics problem. So what we did in several experiments is we did experiments where uh, people before had done experiments, very different types of experiments, interferometric experiments, for example, to see these these signals. But we started wanting to go out uh, to look in the mid IR. So we pumped here at, at 800 nanometers in the near IR, probed at 2.4 microns. Again, we can get and fit the data. Uh, we did that using a, a, a tie sapphire laser pumping an optical parametric device, doing difference frequency generation to get out to 2.4 microns. And then, we actually had a, a, a mercury cadmium telluride quad cell built specifically for this. It's a liquid nitrogen cooled detector for detecting the IR. But we had this quad cell built uh, by a local company here to do these experiments. And that detector worked beautifully well. We also went out past there. We actually started to do purely mid IR. So we excited at 3.5 and probed at 2.5 by using, again, difference frequency generation uh, in, with two different uh, optical parametric devices to do this uh, experiment out in the mid-IR, which had never been done before. So here's the data from 0.8 microns and 2.4 microns, parallel, perpendicular, magic angle. But what's, what, the other thing that we can do to check that data, it turns out that this is, this is overly constrained data. Either any two of these experiments can predict the third. So the blue and the green can predict the third. So this dark red is, is the prediction from these two experiments. And so it's, it's consistent. You can then take this one and this one to predict this one, or this one and this one to predict the blue. So we can check our data to make sure everything works very nice. And so Sally uh, did, did a lot of those experiments to do this for 2.4, just to make sure everything was consistent. Uh, so we can do all the numerical fits, and and we can get out what the what the bound electronic nonlinearity is from this, knowing the the nuclear nonlinearity. When we went to all mid IR, it turns out our signal to noise was not big enough, so we had to increase the pressure. So we built a cell to, so that we could go all the way up to 
to 30 atmospheres with this. And of course, as expected, it's linear in the, in the atmospheric pressure. You're just increasing the density of molecules and so it's proportional to the density. So then what we did is we went from exciting at, eight, at 800 nanometers and probing at 3.3 to then exciting at three and, three and a half microns and probing at 2.5. 2 but there we went all the way up to 30 atmospheres to get the signal and everything matched up very nicely. And that's the first time that was done. But from all these experiments, then we can we can tell, we can extract the nuclear components, but I just wanted to show the bound electronic responses because we could compare that with what people had done before. So people before using interferometric techniques had excited it two, in, in, the, in the IR at 2.4 and then probed in the visible and they got 9.2. Uh, we measured by exciting at 0.8 in the visible or near visible and probing at 2.4, these the, there are reasons you can show that those should by, be identical. With air bars, they were. But we also looked in the visible, got the same value. We looked in the mid IR, got the same value. And for the first time, we excited and probed in the mid IR and saw no dispersion. Quite honestly, before we did these experiments, DARPA paid us to do these. Before we did these experiments, I pretty, we pretty much knew that we were not going to see dispersion, right? But this was the first time we could prove it experimentally. And in, indeed, there are reasons for that because basically Cromer's Chronics told us if you're way out in the IR, all these, all the resonances are in the UV. So we're way away from the UV. So they should be the same. There should not be dispersion. And so that really uh, worked very nicely. And that was the first time those experiments. So now, and I'm going to have to rush here a second. So we can, we can now if, uh, look at the effect of pulse width on the nonlinear refraction. This is the response function. This is the, from that responses, this is the effective nonlinear refraction expected now in the gas phase as a function of pulse width. Remember in the, uh, in the liquid phase, it kind of went up smoothly. Notice here there's a peak. And there's a peak because in the molecules, if you go to a longer pulse, the shorter, shorter pulse is only going to see this positive effect because it's an integral of the response function over the pulse. But when you start getting longer pulses, you start getting a little bit of this negative component coming in. And so you're going to get a peak. And then when you go all the way over to here, it actually gets reduced a little bit and then it stays constant. So you can see how this convolution comes in to, to give this. And these were experiments from different uh, from different laboratories that had been previously published for what the what the nonlinear refraction of air was with different uh, different pulse widths. And so really it, it sort of you can sort of see what what happens there. Given that we can separate out how much was from oxygen, how much was from nitrogen, argon doesn't do much at all. Only, the atmosphere is only 1% argon. And we could look at the effects of pressure on this as you go up to different different pressures. Between zero and one atmosphere, there's basically no those two lines actually overlap. So in the atmosphere, really nothing much happens. We could also look at the effect of the temperature on this. And if you know the effect of temperature and pressure, you can then predict the atmosphere. So here's sea level. Here's what you expect in the troposphere, lower stratosphere, upper stratosphere. Of course, it gets smaller, right? But um, you can predict for beam propagation through the atmosphere. And you can imagine who wants to know this stuff. Uh, you can predict all that uh, in the atmosphere, because here at sea level, you know the, the your, your room temperature and, uh, and and you know the temperatures. Up here, it's really cold and and low pressure, so uh, everything works nicely. Um, you can do all those predictions. Uh, EMP. What did I want to do here? Uh, yeah, that's the effect of no. Oh, this I'm sorry. This is just. This is taking all these, normalizing them to have the same value here, just to see that the shape, the shape actually changes going from here to here uh, by taking all of these, making them all equal at this point to normalize. And you can see that it, in the, at, at, as you go to upper atmosphere, you actually have bigger effects from the uh, uh, higher altitude. So, and the vibration again is not important uh, for these because this goes up to 0.3. It's at this peak, and so if you look out here at 0.01 uh, in this, this range, 
it's 0.3 out of 30. So it's a 1% effect. So we can ignore that. This, this is the paper that was published on this. And the last thing I want to do is just mention this really quickly, is we went back to do another gas, and that's CS2. We did all those experiments in liquids, uh, a liquid CS2 and other liquids. Here's CS2 gas. We see these recurrences, right? You can even see, um, you can even see an isotopolog of CS2 out here. Uh, where the where the ice, there's a different isotope of, of of sulfur. You get sulfur 32 and sulfur 34, and you can see that uh, out here. So it's a very sensitive experiment. But I want to concentrate just on this this first peak, this this first peak here for CS2, and then we can do parallel, perpendicular, magic angle. Here now we're in a gas. In a gas, the collisional nonlinearity is basically zero. So the only thing we see in the gas at the magic angle is the bound electronic response. With that bound electronic response, we can predict how much nonlinear refraction we can get per molecule. That's called the second hyperpolarizability. Don't worry about these numbers. Here's the gas. Here's the liquid. All right. And I made this so they line up so you can see what happens in a liquid. The liquid peaks up at time t equals zero. The gas, we kick it at time t equals zero. The bound electronic response peaks up here, but the gas keeps rotating. So they keep rotating into, into resonance. And actually, it's amazing. You get just about as big a, a, a signal in the gas as you get in the, uh, in the liquid because you have more time to wait. But the bound electronic response is much smaller. In the liquid, I can also calculate how much nonlinear refraction I have per molecule because I know the liquid density. But in a liquid, I have to make corrections for the field because the field that you see on that single molecule in the liquid is screened or it's local field corrected. And the local field correction in a liquid for this, for this bound electronic nonlinearity is quite big. It's a correction factor of 5.3. If I then calculate how much nonlinear refraction per molecule I get in liquid CS2, I see 1.5. I see within my air bars, I would say they're the same. All right. So it's amazing. It tells you that the bound electronic nonlinearity in in the liquid is really just about exactly the same as it is, is in a gas. Uh, we don't think that'll be the case if we actually start out with polar molecules. So we're trying to do look at polar molecules in the future. So. Uh, yeah, I, I need to finish up. So summary and conclusion. Uh, yeah, well, I, I think you can uh, uh, you can read that. I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, stop at this point and just thank all the graduate students and everybody who's been involved with this. Matt Riker did a lot of the CS2 work. Uh, Sally did a lot of, wor of the work uh, uh, with with uh, CS with with gases. Pong Zhao did a lot of the. He's the guy who did the 24 uh, molecules and like so. Uh, and we have fun on the beach here uh, as as well. And of course, I got to thank the thank the sponsors. So uh, with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop and turn it over for uh, questions. Uh, I'll leave the I'll leave the summary up. Sorry, I had to rush there at the end. So thank you very much. Okay, Eric. Thank you very much. Uh, I propose that I open the microphones to say thank you for him. Thank you. So, if you have uh, questions, please raise it, your hand. Questions? Well, I, I have the first question. Sure. Uh, Eric, I did not get how you measured such so big sensitivity for the technique, lambda over 20,000. Uh, can you describe how do you measure this? How do you evaluate? Well, we're, the, the th difference between this and Z-Scan, remember Z-Scan, Z-Scan could do lambda over 1,000. And if you worked hard with the easy scan, you could do lambda over 10,000. Well, that's pretty good. With the two-beam experiment, I can now have the ability to use a lock-in amplifier. So what I do is I'm only modulating, I'm turning, the, I'm turning the excitation beam on and off. 
and I'm looking at the change in my probe signal, that gives me a lot of sensitivity increase to allow me to look at this, uh, this signal. So it's the, it's the addition of the lock-in amplifier that takes me from a straight single beam Z-scan experiment, lambda over 1,000, to lambda over 20,000. Does that make sense? Yeah, there is any influence of the uh, spatial profile of the beam? Well, of course, we, we try to make Gaussian beams. And if we don't have a Gaussian beam, uh, it'll, well, as long as, the, the, the fact is that the noise doesn't necessarily increase as long as the beam stays constant and I find a good gradient on it. What I, what I do usually for beam deflection is I calibrate it with respect to some known sample. So I don't, with Z-Scan, it's absolutely calibrated. You can do absolutely calibrated experiments with the beam deflection, but then you really have to make sure you have good Gaussian beams. And it's, it's much more difficult. Yeah. So what we do is we use, as, what we do with beam deflection, we first put a known sample in, peak up the signal, then calibrate what, it, what the, the nonlinear refraction will be, and then put in our unknown. And so as long as my beam is constant in shape, I'm okay for signal to noise. If the beam is fluctuating in the sense of beam size is changing, that'll tear, that'll get ruin the signal to noise. So in, yeah. In okay. terms of the parameter m squared, what's the m squared that you have to have? Oh uh, well, again, if I calibrate, if I do everything calibrated, I can have a terrible m squared and still do the experiment and get good numbers. As long as M squared is constant from shot to shot, I mean, as long as the shape is constant from shot to shot. So we have used beams with, you know, M squared of one point, less than 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, and then we can do calibrated experiments. Absolutely wow. calibrated. But in general, with these infrared beams, our M squared was like four. So, uh, or, or, or yeah, they could, we could have pretty bad beams. Mm -hmm. But they were constant. So as long as we did a known sample, it didn't matter that the beam had a bad, it, we just, we, we peek up, we find a good slope in there that's constant, and we see that beam deflection. And we're okay as long as the probe is small compared with the terrible shape of the beam. So if the beam is, uh, oh yeah, if the beam has really bad fluctuations on it, it but, but we usually spatially filter to get rid of fast fluctuations. So yeah, we, we get rid of the fast fluctuations, but we only have slow fluctuations and then we're fine. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, next question is from Cecilia Leite Veras. Please, Cecilia. <laughs> ah, Cecilia today is different. <laughs> Cecilia is me. There you go. Anderson. I'm all using Cecilia's computer. Uh, Eric, it, it's, a, uh, it's a technical question. If we do two beam eclipse Z scan, do you think we can get close to to the deflection beam for sensitivity? I would suspect I would suspect you might even do better, uh, as long as you have. But eclipsing requires a lot better beam profile. So it, with eclipsing, you really have to have a good a good beam profile. Um, yeah. So it would be a very difficult experiment. But you could probably get a very good sensitivity. Yeah. Good. I'm telling the students, so no problem. <laughs> <laughs> it would be More challenging. Questions? It would be challenging. More questions? Well, I have another question. <laughs> uh, in these experiments with air, what's the typical intensity that you have to, to, to use? Oh yeah, boy, that was terawatts, terawatts per square centimeter. Yeah, terawatts per square centimeter. And yeah, do, I, some, do I have that written? Oh yeah, it's it's really um, yeah. Do I have? I would think I was somewhere I would have that number, but ter terawatts per square centimeter. Okay, and yeah. then you have this uh, high pressure for some experiments. Yes. Don't you get um, filamentation of the beam? Oh, we yeah, if we did, so we had to we had to we we go up till we start seeing actually we start seeing white light continuum generation, and then we would back off from that, 
so we didn't get ionization. So we'd back off from that by about a factor of two, but that's sort of where we were operating. So um, at high intensities, absolutely. But yeah, we had to be careful not to get filamentation or ionization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and uh, Eric, and no high order nonlinearities at that high intensity even? Nope. No, not, we, we haven't seen anything. Now, uh, I mean, obviously, if we do go, we, we did not try experiments where we were getting up into the, where we were making. So uh, the problem with trying those experiments is then the beam gets all the excitation beam is getting all crazy and it starts getting noisy. Uh, so I don't really think we can do experiments at that at those. But we've thought about it and we'd like to figure out a way to do it. But I don't I don't know at this point. I don't know how to do it. So we're we're below we're below the ionization threshold, but not much below the ionization threshold. We do not see anything that deviates from from straight. Um, and two. Yeah, for these uh, experiments with CS2, 800 nanometers, don't you have three photo absorption? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're yeah, you have three photon absorption, but we're working at, radi at radiances where that's a small effect. Okay. To all, this, all the experiments we did in the liquids were at relatively small radiances, so the signals were relative. The, the changes in uh, uh, the changes in in phases were, you know. Uh, Lambda over a hundred at most, probably. So, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they were small. Now there, we could go up to higher radiances and see if we see some funny effects. We have not done that. Uh huh. Uh, -huh. uh any more questions? I think that Lucio has uh, your hand. His hand. <laughs> no, no, I didn't. I, I, I was. Uh, the, the, my question was answered in yours. It's about the the calibration, and uh, at, actually, I was going to ask how do you find the best uh, slope. But uh, as it's calibrated, that doesn't make any difference, right? You just yeah, have it, to have it doesn't. It doesn't. Noise. But we do with with a with a known sample. We simply we simply move around until we find the best signal. The, okay. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Hey, it's been fun. Uh, I appreciate the invitation. Good, good seeing everybody. Okay, no more questions. Have to see everybody in person next time. Yeah, next yeah. time. Yeah. All right. Well, thank Come you very Orlando. much. Again. Come to Orlando too. Um, <laughs> thank you very much for your presentation, for being here with us. Okay, I thank think you. that no one more has questions. So thanks, we, everybody. Chase. Goodbye. All right. Goodbye. Have a good evening. Bye. 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 Good evening. Yeah. Good weekend. See you, See you so much. Okay. Okay. Okay.